Hello Year 6, I'm Mrs Ackley and I work at Ormiston Horizon Academy in the Success Centre as the Assistant Senko. And I'm really excited to meet you when you join us at Ormiston Horizon Academy. But at the moment, because you're doing this project on Stormbreaker, I've been asked to read a chapter for you. So I'm going to read chapter 10. Hope you're enjoying the book so far. And the chapter I'm going to read is called Death in the Long Grass. Alex was woken up by an indigent Nadia Vole, knocking at his door. He'd overslept. This morning, it is your last opportunity to experience the storm breaker, she said. Right, Alex replied. This afternoon, we begin to send the computers out to the schools. Here, Sale has suggested that you take the afternoon for leisure. A walk, perhaps, into Port Talon. There's a footpath that goes through the fields and then by the sea. You will do that, yes? Yes, I'd like that. Good. And now I leave you to put some clothing on. I will come back for you in ten minutes. Alex splashed cold water onto his face before getting dressed. It had been four o'clock by the time he'd gotten back to his room and he was still tired. His night expedition hadn't been quite the success he'd hoped. He'd seen so much, the submarine, the silver boxes, the death of the guard, who dared to drop one, and yet in the end, he still hadn't learnt much of anything. Yasin Grodovich was working for Herod Sale. That much was certain. But what about the boxes? They could have contained packed lunches for the staff of Sale Enterprises, for all he knew except that you don't kill a man for dropping a packed lunch. Today was March 31st. As Vole had said, the computers were on their way out. There was only one day to go until the ceremony at the Science Museum. But Alex had nothing to report, and the one piece of information that he had sent, Ian Ryder's diagram, had also drawn a blank. There'd been a reply waiting for him on the screen of his Game Boy when he turned it on before going to bed. Unable to recognise diagram or letters or numbers, possible map reference, but unable to source map, please transmit further observations. Alex had thought of transmitting the fact that he'd actually cited Yasin Grogovich, but he'd decided against it. If Yasin was there, Mrs Jones had promised to pull him out. And suddenly, Alex wanted to see this through to the end. Something was going on at Sale Enterprises. He'd never forgive himself if he didn't find out what it was. Nadia Vole came back for him as promised, and he spent the next three hours toying with the Stormbreaker. This time he enjoyed himself less, and this time he noticed when he went to the door, a guard had been posted in the corridor outside. It seemed that Sale Enterprises wasn't taking any more chances where he was concerned. One o'clock arrived and with a sandwich delivered on a paper plate. Ten minutes later, the guard released him from the room and escorted him as far as the main gate. It was a glorious afternoon. The sun was shining as he walked out onto the road. He took at last look back. Mr Green had just come out of one of the buildings and was standing some distance away talking into a mobile phone. There was something unnerving about the sight. Why should he be making a telephone call now? And who could possibly understand a word he said? It was only once he'd left the plant that Alex was able to relax away from the fences, the armed guards and the strange sense of threat that pervade sale enterprises. It was as if he were breathing fresh air for the first time in days. The Cornish countryside was beautiful, the rolling hills a lush green dotted with wildflowers. He found the footpath sign and turned off the road. From the lay of the land and remembering the car journey that had first brought him here, he guessed that Port Talon was a couple of miles away, a walk of less than an hour if the route wasn't too hilly. In fact, the path climbed upward quite steeply almost at once and suddenly Alex found himself perched over a clear blue and sparkling English channel, following a track that zigzagged precociously along the edge of a cliff. To one side of him, the field stretched into the distance with the long grass bending in the breeze. To the other, there was a fall of at least 500 feet to the rocks 
and the water below. Port Talon itself was of, a, of the very end of the cliffs, tucked in against the sea. It took almost too quaint, it looked almost too quaint from here, like a model in a black and white Hollywood film. He came to a break in the path with a second much tougher track leading away from the sea and across the fields. His instincts would have told him to go straight ahead for a footpath sign pointing to the right. There was something strange about the sign. Alex hesitated for a moment, wondering what it was. Then he dismissed it. He was walking in the countryside and the sun was shining. What could possibly be wrong? He followed the sign. The path continued rising and falling for about another quarter of a mile, then dipped down into the hollow. Here the grass was almost as tall as he was, rising up around him. A shimmering green cage, a bird suddenly erupted in front of him, a ball of brown feathers that spun around on itself before taking flight. Something had disturbed it, and that was when Alex heard the sound of an engine getting closer. A tractor? No, it was too high pitched and moving too fast. Alex knew he was in danger the same way an animal does. There was no need to ask why or how, danger was simply there. And even as the dark shape appeared crashing through the grass, he was throwing himself to one side, knowing too late now what, what it was that had been wrong about the second footpath sign. It had been brand new. But the sign, the one that had le led him off to the road, had been weather-beaten and old. Someone had deliberately led him away from the correct path and brought him here, to the killing field. He hit the ground and rolled to one side. The vehicle burst through the grass, its front wheel just inches above his head. Alex caught a glimpse of a squat black thing with four fair ty fat tyres a cross between a miniature tractor and a motorbike. It was being ridden by a hunched up figure in a grey leather with helmet and goggles. Then it was gone, thudding down in the grass on the other side of him and disappearing instantly as if a curtain had been drawn. Alex scrambled to his feet and began to run. He knew that it was now. He'd seen something similar on holiday in the sand dunes of Death Valley, Nevada, a Kawasaki 4x4 powered by a 400cc engine with automatic transmission, a quad bike. It was circling now, preparing to come after him, and it wasn't alone. A drone, then a scream, and then a second bike appearing in front of him, roaring towards him, cutting a swath through the grass. Alex hurtled himself out of his path, once again crashing into the ground, almost dislocating his shoulder. Wind and engine fumes whipped across his face. He had to find somewhere to hide, but he was in the middle of a field and there was nowhere apart from the grass itself. Desperately he fought through it, the blades scratching at his face, half blinding him as he tried to find his way back to the main path. He needed to find someone, anyone, whoever had sent this, these people. And now he remembered Mr Grin talking on his mobile phone. They couldn't, they couldn't kill him if they were witnesses around, but there was no one and they were coming for him again. Together this time, Alex could hear the engines whining in unison, coming up fast behind him. Still running, he glared over his shoulder and saw them, one on each side, seemingly about to overtake him. It was only the glint of the sun and the sight of the grass slicing itself in half that revealed the horrible truth. The two cyclists had stretched a length of cheese wire between them. Alex threw himself head first, flat on his stomach. The cheese wire whipped over him. If he had still been standing up, it would have cut him in half. The quad bikes separated, arching away from each other. At least that meant that they must have dropped the wire. Alex had bruised his knees in the last fall and he knew that it was the only a matter of time before they cornered him and finished him off. Half limping, he ran forward, searching for somewhere to hide and something to defend himself with. Apart from the Game Boy and some money, he had nothing in his pockets, not even a pen knife. The engines were distant now, but he knew that any moment they would be closing in again. 
What would the riders have in store for him next time? More cheese, Wyatt, or something worse? It was worse, much worse. There was a roar of the engine and then billowing cloud of red fire exploding over the grass, blazing it into a crisp. Alex felt it singe his shoulders, yelled and threw himself to one side. One of the riders was carrying a flamethrower. he just aimed a bolt of fire 20 feet long, meaning to burn Alex alive. And he had almost succeeded. Alex was saved only by a narrow ditch in front of him. He hadn't even seen it until he thudded into the ground, into the damp soil, the jet of flame licking at the air just above him. It had been close. There was a horrible smell, his own hair, the fire had singed the ends. Choking, his face shrieked with dirt and sweat. He clambered out of the ditch and ran blindly forward. He had no idea where he was going anymore. He only knew that in a few seconds the quad would be back. But he'd taken only 10 paces before he realised he'd reached the edge of the field. There was a warning sign of an electrified fence stretching as far as he could see. But for the buzzing sound that the fence was making, he would have run right into it. The fence was almost invisible and the quad bikers moving fast toward him would be unable to hear the warning sound of their own en over their own engines. He stopped and turned around. About 50 yards away from him, the grass was being flattened by the still invisible quad as it made its next charge. But this time, Alex waited. He stood there, balancing on the heels of his feet like a matador. 20 yards, 10. Now he was staring straight in the eyes of the rider saw the man's uneven teeth as he smiled, still gripping the flamethrower. The quad smashed down the last barrier of grass and leaped onto him, except Alex was no longer there. He dived to one side and, too late, the driver saw the fence and rocketed on, straight into it. The man screamed as the wire caught him around the neck, almost garroting him. The bike twisted in mid-air, then crashed down. The man fell into the grass and lay still. He'd torn the fence out of the ground. Alex ran over to the man and examined him. For a moment, he thought it might be Yasin, but it was a younger man, darker-haired, ugly. Alex had never seen him before. The man was unconscious, but still breathing. The flamethrower lay extinguished on the ground beside him. Behind him, he heard the other bike, some distance away, but closing. Whoever these people were, they tried to run him down to cut him in half and to incinerate him. He had to find a way out before they could get, before they really got serious. He ran over to the quad, which had come to rest lying on its side. He heaved it up again, jumped onto the saddle and kick-started it, or tried to. His foot scrambled desperately, but couldn't find anything to kick. Alex cursed. He might have seen quad bikes in Nevada, but he hadn't been allowed to ride one. He was too young. And now, how did you get the damn thing started? There was nothing to kick. So there had to be some sort of manual ignition. He twisted the key, nothing. Then he saw a red button right in the middle. He pressed it and the engine coughed into life. At last, there was no gears to worry about. Alex twisted the accelerator and yelled out as the machine rocketed away almost throwing him backward off the saddle. And now he was whipping through the grass, which had become a green blur, hanging on with all his strength as the quad carried him back towards the footpath. He wasn't sure if he was steering the bike, if the bike was steering him, but all he cared about was that he was still moving. His bones rattled as the quad hit a rut in the truck and bounced upward. For a ghastly second, Alex thought he was going to be hurtled off the bike and into space. But somehow he managed to keep his grip, even though the crash of the tyres hitting the ground punched out of his breath. He cut through another green curtain and savagely pulled onto the handlebars, trying to bring the machine under control. He'd found the footpath and also the side of the cliff. Just five yards more and he would have launched himself over the edge and down to the rocks below. For a few seconds he sat there. He was the engine idle. That was when the other quad appeared. The second rider must have seen what had happened. 
He'd reached the footpath and was facing Alex. About 200 feet away, something glinted in his hand, resting on the handlebar. He was carrying a gun. Alex looked back the way he'd come. It was no good. The path was too narrow. By the time he turned the quad around, the man would have reached him. One shot and it would all be over. Could he go back into the grass? No, for the same reason. If he wanted to move fast, he had to move forward, even if that meant heading for a straight-on collision with the other quad. There was no other way. The man gunned his engine and spurted forward. Alex did the same. Now the two of them were racing towards each other down a narrow path with the bank of earth and Rocky suddenly rising up from the barrier on one side and the edge of the cliff on the other. There wasn't enough room for them to pass. They could stop or they could crash, but if they were going to stop, they had to do it in the next 10 seconds. The quads were getting closer and closer, moving faster all the time. Far below, the waves glittering silver, breaking against the rocks. The grass, higher now, flashed by. The man fired his gun twice. Alex felt the first bullet slice past his shoulder. The second ricocheted off the side of his bike, almost causing him to lose control. The wind rushed into him, hammering at his chest and face. It was like the old-fashioned game of chicken. One of them had to stop. One of them had to get out of the way. Three, two, one. It was the man who had finally broke. He was less than 20 feet away, so close that Alex could make out with perspiration on his forehead. If he'd fired a third shot now, there would be no way he could miss but he was travelling too fast. The path was too uneven. He couldn't fire and drive at the same time. Just when it seemed that a crash was inevitable, he twisted his quad and swerved off the path, up into the grass. At the same time, he tried to bring the gun around, but it was too late. His quad was slanting, tipping over onto just two of his wheels. The man screamed, his quad hit a rock and bounced upward, landing briefly on the footpath then continued over the edge of the cliff. Alex had felt the man rush past him, but had seen little more than a blur. Now he shuddered to a halt and turned around just in time to watch the other quad fly off the cliff and into the air. The man, still screaming, managing to separate himself from the machine on the way down, but the two of them hit the water at the same moment. The quad floated for a few seconds longer than the man who had sent him. It was Nadia Vole who had suggested the walk, but it was Mr Grin who had actually seen him leave. Mr Grin had given the order. He was sure of it. Alex took the quad for the rest of the way into Port Talon. The sun was still shining as he sped down into the little fishing village, but he couldn't enjoy it. He was angry with himself because he knew he'd made too many mistakes. He should have been dead now. He knew. Only luck and a low voltage electric fence had managed to keep him alive. And that's me finished year six. Hope you enjoyed it. What an exciting chapter. So you've got a workbook now that you can open up and answer some of the questions about the chapter. All right, take care. Bye.